Hello, everyone. My name is Pratisha Charganla. Feel free to call me Prat. I'm a site reliability engineer at Adobe, where I'm working to improve reliability for internal platform services. So just a little bit more about me. I joined Adobe one year back as a new grad. And while I had previously worked in backend engineering and full stack engineering roles, this is the first time I was exposed to site reliability engineering. And what can I say? It's been an amazing year. I've learned so much about the tenets of reliability, really why is it important to keep a service reliable and how can we do so? This talk is actually a compilation of the three most important points that I've learned in the past year. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. One of the most important things I've learned was to really take a proactive over reactive approach. Because as I found out, it's really all about the numbers. We're really concerned about numbers, like how long is it, has, is it taking to resolve the issue? How long has our service been down? What's the availability? Has our availability been impacted by these outages? And I realized the best way to really focus on optimizing these numbers and reducing numbers such as time to resolve or time to detect or you know, downtime is really to take a more proactive approach. Firefighting really does not it does not do much most of the time. And I found out that reactive approaches typically equal less productivity because we're spending more time firefighting, diagnosing, trying to find the issue and resolving it as they come rather than less time really innovating or thinking of ways to really reduce the resolution time or the detection time or even prevent outages. Which brings me to my first proactive approach. Focus on building tools to prevent outages or minimize the impact. Really, we're trying to answer questions like, what are the areas of toil or human effort that we're seeing? And how can we reduce this? What are ways we can reduce detection or even resolution time? Is this, is this a gap in our monitoring that may have caused this issue? It's really asking, asking questions like this and thinking of solutions to these questions is really key to building some of these tools and maintaining a more proactive approach to how we approach reliability. Another proactive approach is chaos engineering. Briefly, chaos engineering is introducing faults into our system to test how resilient and robust they are and how tolerant they are to unplanned failures. The more we know about how our system is functioning in cases like this, the more we can learn and really improve upon them. We're really trying to answer questions like, is our system failing gracefully in a way that minimizes customer impact? And if it's not, then what can we do so, so that it does do that? But at the same time, chaos engineering is not you know, throwing stones into a river and seeing you know, how much of an impact or splash or puddle we're trying to make. Really, it's more about having a controlled experiment. So we need to take care to ensure that the blast radius is not too large. And as in every controlled experiment, we follow a couple of steps. One, start by picking a hypothesis. What are we trying to measure? What are we looking at? Two, understanding the scope of the experiment. What components are we dealing with? What nodes or clusters are we focusing on? Three, identify the metrics we're going to watch. Understand that this is what we're going, probably going to be the results that we're going to be looking at. And for running the experiment, be sure to pick an experiment that actually stimulates a real world experience so you know how your system is failing in a similar situation. And finally, really analyze the results. Once again, you know, take this opportunity to learn what your system is doing and how you can improve on this in the future iterations. Some tools that can be used in this case are Chaos Monkey, Gremlin, Chaos Mesh, which is specifically for the Kubernetes environment. But you're not limited to these tools. There are many more available. Another proactive approach we can take is game days. It's very similar to chaos engineering, but slightly different. In game days, we are running a scenario where an attacker will attack the system maliciously. And we're trying to see how does our team respond? How are they prepared to handle such issues 
So as you can see, not only are we looking at how our system is responding, but we're actually focused on really team response. How is our team cohesively working together to resolve the issue? It's good to practice this at least once a quarter so that we can see as things are changing, is our team able to keep up? Are there any gaps in the knowledge that we need to address or any other issues that may come up? At the very end of game day or even a chaos engineering exercise, be sure to make a list of all the things that could have gone differently. Were there issues with team operations, communication, any issues with the system, any issues in the monitoring, or even any issues in actual incident management? Maybe the right people weren't called in at the right times, resulting in a delay. These are all important things to consider when, when an actual event happens. Speaking of which, this leads me directly to my next point actually, which is incident management. I realized that incident management is not really just when does, when does a incident or outage occur and how fast have we fixed it? There's so much more to it. It really starts from the very beginning, you know, the attacker, the deployment or change that may have led to the issue all the way to the actual postmortem, where we're analyzing what went wrong and how we can improve on it in future iterations. Effective incident management requires that we have clearly defined roles. Who is the one in charge, the product the owner? Who are the ones we should bring on board? Is there someone making sure that we're bringing the right people on board or contacting the right people? Do we have an overseer? These are all questions we need to make sure when we're defining roles. Afterwards, this doesn't stop there. We need to make sure that someone's responsible to make sure that there's a write-up because we want, we want to be able to document our process so that in future iterations, we know what, what went wrong or what went well and we can improve upon them. Finally, who's responsible for setting up a postmortem so we can review what went wrong and reflect? I realized incident management is very much like a theater play. Each member has a part to play. And only together can we, can we put together an amazing play, starting from the resolution and the climax all the way to the satisfying ending. Only together can we form a cohesive story and come to our happy ending. Second important point is to really learn from our experiences. You know, take this opportunity to understand how you got where you are and what can be improved. Figure out what these long-term fixes are. What went wrong and how can these be fixed? You know, whether this is an, uh, an improvement in the process, something in the system, or even in how we responded to these issues. Really, this is, our, this is our time to be critical and reflect so that in future iterations, we can prevent similar errors or we can optimize, optimize in different areas that we may not have thought about before. Finally, we wanna map out the story so that others can learn from it as well. We want to prevent similar issues from happening to us and also happening to other systems. It's so really documenting this is key. So this is a quote I really like that really talks about how incidents should be handled from Lauren Hochstein, senior software engineer at Netflix. He says, any operational surprise or an oopsie as he refers to them is a potential opportunity for learning. And I think this is a great approach. We don't wanna think about incidents and outages as something that's completely bad. Yes, customers were impacted, but this is our chance to learn. This is our chance to understand what we've done wrong and really think about how we can improve on this in future iterations. Turns me to my next point, ensuring that we have sufficient monitoring coverage. So why is this important? Well, gaps in monitoring leads to outages not being detected sooner for one. And what this means is if issues can be detected sooner because we have better monitoring coverage, this means that we can minimize their impact and downtime of our service. And additionally, less impact leads to happier customers and more customer satisfaction. What more incentives do we have to, for maintaining for making sure that we have monitoring coverage than happier customers. Now, some ways we can ensure coverage. One, really taking this chance to understand what is important. Understand what are the core functionalities of the service and what do our customers value? 
and then making alerts and monitors around those. Leads to, leading me to my next point, monitoring SLIs. Just a quick overview for those of us who are not too familiar with the terminology. SLIs, or service level indicators, are metrics we use to measure the service. SLOs, or service level objectives, are the thresholds that we're setting for each of these metrics. And SLAs, or service level agreements, are agreements with their users or the customers. Basically, it's the, uh, it's the more contract side of things where we're saying, if, if we don't maintain a certain level of service, then we will compensate you in some way. Put these together, I really like this representation from New Relic of how these three terms come together. X should be true, our SLI metric X. Y proportion of the time where Y is our threshold, SLO, or else, which is our SLA, or our repercussions that happen if we don't maintain our if we don't maintain our metric at, if we don't maintain our metric or we breach our, breach our threshold. So really when we're picking SLIs, since they're so customer centric, we're choosing metrics that our users or customers will care about. So this could be availability, it could be latency, it could be throughput. What it really depends on is the service and the features that your customers value most. This is a very customer centric approach that you're taking here. Some of the pros for defining SLIs is one, it demonstrates service health because you know what's important to your customers and you know what level of service you need to maintain. Two, it can help you prioritize and drive your decisions. If you're trying to decide what project or what area to work on next, you can see how it'll impact SLIs and make your decision based on that. Three, it can help reduce alert fatigue. So I realized there's a spectrum in monitoring. One, you have too little. If you have too little, what ends up happening is you have gaps, as we discussed earlier, and gaps can lead to longer, longer detection times. Too many alerts is also a problem because too many alerts means you're over monitoring. And this can lead to alert fatigue. The important alarms will be buried in all the unimportant ones that your engineers are being bombarded with. And eventually you can't figure out what's actually important to act upon and what's not. So what you're really trying to do is you're trying to find that little sweet spot, you know, right where, right where you're monitoring exactly what's important to you, what's important for, to keep your service running, and also understanding what is important to your customers. What services or features do they value most in your service? And monitoring and creating your alerts and monitors based on that. Another way we can ensure coverage is to regularly audit our, our alerts and our monitors. As systems change and functionalities change and priorities change, oftentimes alerts can go stale or they might not be updated, which can lead to gaps. And as we know, gaps means it'll take longer for a service to be detected or for an outage or issue to be detected. So regularly monitoring, regularly auditing our monitors and alerts can prevent this. Fourth, outsiders are actually very important. Having outsiders review how we're monitoring and alerting can be, can be very, very helpful, especially those from a sister or a team. Having those fresh set of eyes could potentially identify gaps that you may not have seen. Having customers review review them can it might even be helpful in the long term because you'll understand what's important to them and they'll provide new fresh perspective as well which leads me to my last point that's right i did fool you i said three but i threw an extra one in there as a freebie last point outside perspectives so why are they important they're very important because the more fresh eyes that you have the more diversity and different experiences you have the less bias there will be. And less bias usually leads to better code. And let me tell you about a phenomenon that often happens in teams. We see a phenomenon called groupthink, where people strive for consensus within a group. And oftentimes people will set aside their own personal beliefs or ideas to adopt the opinion of the rest of the group. This is not, this is not necessarily bad. 
this just means that there's more cohesion in the group. But the problem with this is that because there's more cohesion, oftentimes this will stifle innovation more because people are more concerned with maintaining the consensus of the group than they are with presenting or standing by their own ideas. So having those fresh set of eyes, those outsiders, that diversity in experiences and backgrounds can really increase the number of ideas that you have, bring about more innovation, more methods or strategies to approach the same problem. And finally, we can change the status quo. As I mentioned earlier, having those outside perspectives means that we can change the way we do things, find more optimal methods, and really better our services that way. So with that, let me move on to our final takeaways. One, taking a proactive over reactive approaches. Really taking the time to understand, you know, how can I improve my service in XYZ components? And also thinking about approaches like game days or chaos engineering, where we're really taking the time to proactively think of ways to improve our service rather than reacting whenever an incident occurs. Two, effective incident management. This really starts from the very beginning of our story all the way to the very end, making sure that we, everyone has defined roles throughout this entire process and is working to our cohesively as a team. And additionally, this also means that, that at the very end, you're taking the time to really understand what you've done wrong and really learn from all your experiences and grow from there. Three, sufficient monitoring coverage. This means that making sure you're finding that little sweet spot where you're monitoring your service enough so that both, so that you're not facing alert fatigue and you're not under monitoring as well. And you're also taking this time to really audit your monitoring and your alerts, either by yourselves and additionally, by a second set of eyes who may not who might not have that insider's perspective. Speaking of perspectives, brings me to my final point: having those outside perspectives, having an outsider really come in and look at your service or work with you can really help bring about new ideas. It counters group think, and it brings about more innovation. As engineers, that's, a, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to innovate. We're trying to think of new ways to change the world. So let's do it working all together. Thank you very much for listening. Feel free to reach out to me via Twitter or LinkedIn, or even on Slack after this. I'd love to hear your perspectives, your learnings, and any other strategies you may have for improving reliability as a whole. Thank you so much. And have a great rest of your day. Bye.